Jane said, my name is Gail Thomas. I'm a professor and dean of the health of uh, the Faculty of Health and Social Sciences, and also the chair of the Fair Access Agreement Management Group. And it's really with the second hat on that I'm here tonight. Really, I'm aware from talking to James that B has been running a series of open events, which are available to staff to students and to the wider communi community on a range of equality and diversity related topics such as mental health and it's a really important feature of university life to reach out into the community and to make a difference so events like this are important. Um, and I see these open events as an ideal opportunity to support the university's commitment to fair access and widening participation which also provide the local community for an excellent opportunity to find out more about what's going on here, the good work that's happening at the university. So the focus tonight's on de de eating disorders, which, as you know, is an important both societal and individual issue. Although eating disorders tend to be more common in certain age groups, it's not uncommon for eating disorders to affect people of any age. Around 1 in 250 women and 1 in 2,000 men will experience anorexia nervosa at some point, and the condition usually develops at around the age of 16 or 17. Bulimia is around five times more common than anorexia nervosa, and 90% of people with bulimia are female. It usually develops around the age of 18 or 19. Binge eating usually affects males and females equally, and usually appears later in life, between the ages of 30 and 40. Because of the difficulty of precisely defining binge eating, it is not clear how widespread the condition is. The point of raising these statistics really is just to give a really highlight the prevalence of eating disorders in our society. And for each person experiencing a disorder, there will be many other people also affected. That includes family, friends, colleagues, teachers, employers, <coughs> and so on. So this evening is about the lived experience of being touched by someone with an eating disorder. It's an opportunity to hear from a variety of people working in the field and to look at some of the work of some BU students, as James has said, who've been researching and doing projects in the field as well. I hope you find it interesting. I hope you find it informative and useful, really, and that you will get the opportunity to talk to people and to build a bit of a network with individuals who are committed to raising awareness of, of having a positive impact on those with eating disorders and for those who care with and for them. If you wish to tweet, as James said, feel free to do so. Um, it's not something I'm particularly familiar with, but it's getting more and more prevalent, and it's an opportunity to share and build that network, really. Um, and it's now my pleasure to hand over to Lorna Gardner, the Chief Executive of BEAT, to talk in more detail about the current issues in eating disorders. Good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Beach is a charity that's been running for about 25 years and specifically focuses on eating disorders. I'm going to throw some stats at you. Sorry, more. <laughs> this publication is some, the result of some work that we had done through PricewaterhouseCoopers and it's published in February. Although it's headlined the cost of eating disorders, it's not just about the economic and financial cost, it's also about the life costs to people, because behind these statistics are people. And what's quite mind-blowing about the economic cost to UK PLC is that conservatively, PwC estimate on the research that they did that it's over £15 billion a year. And a large proportion of that cost is lost income because of people whose lives are affected and blighted at a young age, and so therefore they don't realise their full potential from education or from employment or careers. And that's one of the reasons why I'm really pleased to come and speak to you this evening. That's actually yours now. <laughs> I have some more, if anybody would like some. 82% of the people who suffer from an eating disorder will first notice the symptoms of their eating disorder under the age of 16. Of that, 50% will take a year before they speak to anybody about it. That means 80% of 
82% of these young people, um, or 50% of those people, are already experiencing entrenched eating disorder behaviour before they speak to anybody. One in 84 of the entire population has a diagnosed eating disorder, and that's the whole population, which means that one in 30 school-age pupils has an eating disorder. If you're a teacher, you are undoubtedly going to have somebody in your class who has an eating disorder. That's the incidence that we're talking about. That's how important this is. And then if you think about those people around the people who have an eating disorder, it affects carers, it affects brothers and sisters and parents and grandparents and friends. And it has a serious knock-on effect in terms of quality of life, um, ambitions and cost. 70% of those people with an eating disorder will suffer for five or more years. That's a very long period of time. So that's the stats that reflect the diagnosed people. And the majority of people that we know, that we speak to, <coughs> food, who call our helplines and who contact us through our social media and through our um, online messaging, have not been diagnosed, but they know that they have an issue or they know that somebody that they love or care about has an issue. So if we think about when this happens, young people at that period of time in their life when they're making life decisions, they're going through education, they're setting the groundwork, the framework for what it is they're going to become and what they're going to achieve the rest of their life. That's a really important time and they have this to deal with, they also have the changes in their body to deal with, they have peer pressure to deal with, they have social media to deal with. So approaching it at this point in time is crucial. Early intervention for any debilitating disease is important. So that means that there is a community responsibility, so we all play a part in this. It isn't just down to the health service. How can it be if they're not aware? Because these people haven't spoken to them, they haven't been diagnosed. So the responsibility that exists with community as a whole, and educators are part of that community, is very real. Now I do feel so very, very sorry for educators because there's so much that's sort of placed upon you um, outside education. Um, and so the burden I know is quite heavy. But if you think about it in terms of you are going to have people in your classes or going through your lectures who have an eating disorder and you're also going to have more people who are affected by somebody else's eating disorder going through your education, it just goes to prove how important it is for us to be working with education in order to address it. So how would you approach that? Um, it's, uh, it, it's not... It's not something that everybody knows about, and it's not something that, um, that, that you can just put into one nice little um, easy package, because it is, is quite complex, <coughs> as was explained earlier. I would recommend, and Beat recommends, that um, educators take a top-down approach. Setting the culture um, is really what makes the difference. Helping to remove the stigma by encouraging people to learn, to train, to understand. Having a policy is quite important too. Training your staff so that they're informed, so that they're aware of what it is they can and can't do, and how they can support proactively people who have an eating disorder, or who are related to, or who are friends of somebody who has an eating disorder. And more importantly, being able to help people to recognise in that first year when we're talking about those under 16 young people, 50% of whom don't speak to anybody, being able to catch them at that time, which is the really important time, before the behaviour becomes entrenched, and at a time when recovery is so, so very much on the cards, that's really the time when we need to be approaching young people about it. In the introduction, um, we talked about anorexia nervosa. 
up to 10% of those people who are diagnosed with anorexia nervosa will die prematurely, either from suicide or from organ failure as a result of their illness. It is the mental illness with the highest mortality rate of any. It's that important, it's that serious. And as I said, behind all of these stats, there are people. Recently, I spent time with a number of parents who have lost young people. And I have to tell you, it's harrowing. It's really, really harrowing. And the message that comes through very, very clearly from all those parents is they wish that they had recognised signs earlier. They wish that they had been able to work with all the people who were involved with their, their children earlier. Eating disorders are not, they don't pick a particular demographic, they, although they may, the signs may show in younger people more than anybody else, but they don't, partic they don't pick a particular ethnicity either. And the second largest cohort of eating disorder patients in the UK come from the Asian community. So any, any stigma that there might be around, um, or any myth that there might be around, it, it's something that happens to skinny, white, middle-class girls who are high achievers, is false. It happens to everybody. But, as I said before, full recovery is possible, and that's, that's the reason why Beach exists. That's what we want to promote. We have currently 78 young ambassadors who go into universities and they go into schools and they talk about their experiences. They talk about what it was really like for them. And they explain to people how it was that they got onto the road of recovery and where they are. Now that to me is something really, really worth celebrating. So I hope that what comes from this evening is that really positive message that yes, it's very serious and yes, we need to do something about it quite quickly and quite drastically, but it has so much hope for a really positive outcome. And thank you very much. Okay, um, now we'll take the opportunity to share with you, um, Sarah and I, some of the work that we've been doing here at the university uh, for the last five years. I think really before we give some examples of, 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 of what we have been doing, I'm just going to illustrate, um, not point by point, uh, but some of the, the drivers, the motivations behind uh, the work so far. Clearly, there's been a strong reference to uh, equality and diversity in, in, in relation to the university's strategic plan. I think also what I've been very pleased to see has been a really strong partnership with the Trust and the university. And I think, I think for me personally, we wouldn't be here today talking about this work if it wasn't for that, 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 that relationship. And those words weren't given to me by anyone from the Trust or the university. I do want to stress that. Uh, but I do think I do need to, 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 to recognise that as well. Clearly, the university has made a commitment to signing the Time to Change organisational pledge, so clearly looking to address stigma and discrimination within the workplace and the study environment, and clearly that's also provided a framework and um, a, a motivation to, 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 to work in this area. And I suppose recently as well, two areas which I've um, found very helpful um, is clearly our fair access work. Uh, that's made a strong reference to joining up equality and diversity and fair access. You could say I'm incredibly sad here, but I got quite excited when I saw that because I actually thought that's doing what we've actually been doing um, since, you know, since, 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 since being in post here. And clearly, I think, from what I've seen currently as well, uh, support from the Time to Change Dorset Group. Um, and that I think has been encouraging because I think um, a theme that might come out I'm hoping from tonight is that we've achieved what we've achieved through partnership uh, and, and, and that, that's a clear, a clear message from me um, some of the background clearly there has been uh, support in place uh, since 2004 and clearly that's been developed further when the trust uh, had, had, had a, a drop-in service uh, from Cambridge Court, clearly in the health centre, uh, sorry, the medical centre, and really we've, I suppose, 
developed that further um, in 2011 when we started running a programme of events uh, to mark Eating Disorder Week. And I think what I was always struck with uh, was when uh, Dr. Kieran Newell, uh, sorry Kieran, uh, came to give a talk. And I thought, wow, there's a hundred people turning to hear Kieran speak. And actually, that was telling me something. That was telling me actually, there's interest here. There's actually strong interest um, in coming to hear about eating disorders. So, you know, it's it, it saying there is the need um, for information and support. What we have done since then, clearly, obviously, we've had professional speaking, but we've tried to, uh, to focus also, more importantly, on the lived experience. And, okay, okay, clearly you will see some videos shortly, um, but I'm grateful for colleagues um, to come and share their own lived experiences. And just looking at some of the um, feedback, uh, well, the YouTube hits, um, I know uh, one of the videos uh, provided by uh, John Evans has had over 1,000 views on YouTube. And so, again, that's saying there is interest there. Sorry, John, to embarrass you there. Um, <clears throat> And clearly Sarah's going to be talking about some of the academic research that has been done earlier. And also, just to highlight what we have tried to do, which actually raised some interesting feedback from our students, we've offered on two occasions a bake sale. And we actually had queries from our baking society about why we're we running a bake sale during Eating Disorder Week. And I must admit that actually threw us, threw me. And then, well, maybe not through you, but through me. And so, you know, it was just trying to uh, address some of those, um, well, address the knowledge, raise awareness, and clearly we did, because I believe in the first, yes, well, the first time we ran the bake sale, we raised over £70 um, for uh, I. I've made reference to the online resources, uh, a plug, yes but they are available on the university's uh, Dignity, Diversity and Equality playlist. Feel free to have a look at those. As Gail has already mentioned, there's been a strong emphasis on the programme being inclusive. Um, I do want to stress that. And clearly, in addition to what else we've been doing, there's a, a drop-in service being offered by um, our chaplain CT. Here's some examples of impact. And clearly, we, we aren't asking questions about levels of confidence in this area. Um, and we've had some of the participant responses. I won't bore you totally with the stats, but clearly you can see there's an increase in confidence there when people come in to, 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 to attend the event and leave. Some quality feedback, clearly, and you can see that's helping to raise awareness, um, whether that's students or staff or practitioners. What struck me was some of the feedback from um, a counsellor coming to attend one of the events in 20, uh, 2014. <coughs> Similar levels of increasing confidence were shown for uh, this year, which I was very pleased about. And clearly some powerful feedback that's actually come from uh, participants who attended the events this year. The one quote that particularly struck me was the first one. Um, uh, and, and with one of the participants basically feeding back to one of our speakers that from hearing her talk, she hasn't actually cut herself for over a week. Um, now, I think that's clearly demonstrating a positive impact um, for that participant, which uh, clearly um, I was very pleased with. Okay, so over to Sarah. Thank you, James. Um, so yeah, I'd like to take this opportunity to give a bit of background about some of the research that we do here at Bournemouth University as well. So our key question for all of the research we do is how can we improve early intervention for people with eating disorders? Now Lorna's already um, described this in quite a bit of detail, but we know that the earlier eating disorders are recognised, the earlier they're treated, the better the outcome. Um, left untreated, eating disorders become chronic, they become difficult to treat, um, and they, um, obviously there's lots of patient outcomes involved with that as well. So that's the key question that we try to address in all of the research that we do. And we do this in kind of three broad areas in the work that the students and myself do. We look into early recognition of eating disorders and we've done some studies um, looking both into understanding public awareness of what eating disorders are and also people's own um, awareness of what eating disorders are and how they're motivated to change their eating disorder. So some of the things that we found is that um, the public gets all of their information about eating disorders from the media. 
But we know that also that the media covers um, the topics of anorexia, but they don't cover topics such as male eating disorders in enough detail. They don't cover issues such as binge eating disorder. Um, motivation to change in the inpatients as well. We've done lots of lived experience research looking at people's own understandings of what um, motivated them to change. And the key finding that came from this was a, a massive ambivalence about change. So for them, eating disorders can be something that is a coping mechanism. It can be difficult to then switch into um, wanting to recover from their eating disorder. We can't start thinking about early intervention unless we start understanding the cognitions or the beliefs and the experiences um, and the impact that this has on people's behaviours. And in this area, we've also been looking into motivation to change again. This is kind of a recurring topic in our research looking into what people's beliefs are about their eating disorder, how that impacts that motivation to change, and then how that then um, leads on to recovery. We're also starting to look into the role of set shifting, and there's a, um, a poster over there going into much more detail um, for you to have a look at afterwards, looking into um, how people find it maybe difficult to switch between one task and another, and how this may then impact into intervention and treatment. And also the role of self-compassion. So self-esteem is a big issue in people with eating disorders. How can we use self-compassion, the ability to understand, accept our mistakes like ourselves? How can we turn um, issues with self-esteem on its head and, and kind of deliver very early prevention interventions using self-compassion? The third broad area that we're looking into is kind of delivery methods of early intervention. And we know from talking to lots of different people that web-based delivery is actually one of the most acceptable forms of that very early kind of intervention. So being delivered um, over, the, over um, websites is more preferable because there is that anonymity, there is the convenience, but there's also no commitment to take that first step to the recovery centre. And although that sounds negative, that's actually um, one of the positives of kind of going forward with a web-based delivery method. We've also started looking into mobile phone apps um, and looking at whether these are useful, are they relevant, are they helpful to people with eating disorders. And we found over 250 odd um, mobile phone apps and out of that about six were useful to people in their recovery. A lot of them were very insensitive to people, they were um, just to be avoided completely. And if you want more information, um, I think we have a poster somewhere about the six um, main um, apps that we actually recommend. A lot of the research I've been talking about is leading on to intervention, as I've said, and the key intervention that we've developed over the last couple of years, um, with Kieran, with Jess, um, with students, and with lots of um, people with lived experience, we've created the Motivate Intervention. Um, the whole idea of the Motivate Intervention is that once someone is referred to an eating disorder service, they can be given the web intervention to have a go, to become motivated to attend. For our research, we found that people with eating disorders are ambivalent to change, so this um, intervention starts to address that ambivalence. We've also found by surveying, um, surveying services across the UK that approximately 25% of people who are referred to a secondary service never attend that first assessment appointment. Um, but a lot of the people that we've talked to have said that if they had a web-based delivery method, that would help them to make that first step. Just a little plug now for another event that we've got going on. On the 13th of July, we have a conference um, on how we can improve service attendance and eating disorders. Again, with Lorna, we'll be speaking there, and Jess, Kira, and myself. Starting to really unpick um, all of the different issues around why are people not attending, and then starting to think about solutions. We've also got a funding proposal in. We're waiting in July. We've got every finger, toe crossed that we... Um, get um, the funding to do a very large randomised trial across services across the UK to see if the Motivate intervention will work and if it does improve attendance. And future directions of this research, so we don't want it to stop there, we want to start thinking about can we approve treatment attendance, so yes they may attend the assessment but then can we then offer other um, implications of this that then improve treatment as they go along. Is there acceptance in young people? And can we start using this sort of model for kind of pre-GP intervention, getting people into services even earlier? Um, so that's the key overview of the research we've got going on. I'll hand you back to James. Before we um, 
I suppose, show you the, the videos. We'd just like to just give you some background, some context um, to, um, I suppose, what motivated us, really. Um, and, and clearly, we want to talk about, very briefly, the Time to Change Dorset videos. These were videos that were produced in 2012, and clearly they um, had support from students and staff, the Trust, Dorset Mental Health Forum, and clearly Time to Change. Um, it was a development on the previous work that we uh, commissioned um, with the Trust in 2011, just at the same time that the University signed the Time to Change organisational pledge. We originally wanted to produce one video, and I think um, I, I, I would like to take the opportunity just to remind people, but we, we actually had to produce three. Reason being is because we actually had so many people wanting to come forward. And there was a debate um, with myself and other colleagues, well, you know, do we have the better people on camera or not? And clearly it was a very clear message from me that we needed to do to be inclusive. So in essence, we had 14 people. Now, clearly we couldn't actually get everyone into... Uh, um, a four minute video for four, you know, 14 people clearly wouldn't work uh, but, so we produced three those three videos were, were as a result of filming that was undertaken in February and March and it was launched in, in May uh, 2012 as we can see we had 100 people attend that event and clearly numbers are higher this time than last time um, if my math serves me correctly uh, we're looking at about a 50% increase on attendance, which clearly is for me um, a very positive thing. I was hedging my bets over time, but I'm not going to show the videos now because I, I, I think it's probably more important that actually we, we, we actually see the two videos that we've commissioned. But again, they are available um, on the YouTube channel if you want to watch them. Um, want to highlight some of the views? Uh, okay, two years ago. You might or might not expect that, but clearly we've had over 6,000 views on YouTube. Um, and I think that's, for me, been very positive. Uh, we've had positives. Uh, well, we've had some likes, uh, clearly 34. Um, we've had one dislike, fair enough. Um, and clearly we've had people leaving positive feedback um, publicly as well. You've seen some examples there. Now, what we've also tried to do, now we thought, well, it's great, we can produce videos, and clearly... One thing I should have mentioned earlier is that one of the motivations for producing these videos was to provide a different approach to raising awareness of mental health issues. Clearly, we can offer them today through talks, for events, but they may not reach everyone. And you could argue, actually, we're already preaching to the converted. So we'd want to take that opportunity through these type, you know, the video approach to uh, raise broader awareness. Now, to establish what type of impact those videos had, we commissioned, a, well, we pulled together a survey, and that survey was called The Attitudes to Mental Health. I'm just giving you some of the findings um, after looking at, looking at them again today, and clearly there's overwhelming support here for the use of uh, personal stories uh, to raise awareness of mental health issues. Interestingly enough, when we ask the question about where you come from, do you live or do you live outside Dorset? there's a pretty much a 50-50 split. And I suspect that's possibly explained by the fact that Time to Change Dorset, uh, sorry, Time to Change nationally, were happily throwing their support behind the programme. I think for me though, illustration of substance is seeing some of the feedback, the quotes, okay, these are sample quotes, just two, there are more, but clearly we wouldn't have time. But clearly you're showing some, some positive feedback from the well, from the individuals that watch uh, the videos here. Again, I suppose it's important to say thank you to those individuals that took part in the work and clearly the organisations that supported it because it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for those, 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 those participating uh, well, organisations and individuals. Now... Let's get to the presentation. So clearly, we're here today to um, watch um, and, 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 and see the premiere of, of two, two, two videos. Um, and again, thank you for, for, for coming. Um, I suppose I want to, to, to also take that opportunity um, 
to say a big thank you to all the participants. Um, if it wasn't for you, uh, and some of you are here tonight, we wouldn't actually be here tonight. So I want to say a big thank you, and a big thank you uh, to those that actually uh, can't be here tonight. And actually, should we just show our appreciation? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, now, that was a brief. We've clearly developed that in partnership with uh, staff from the university. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, clearly colleagues from the trust. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, much appreciated. And clearly, we had participants. Um, in total, we had 11 participants that took part in the, 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 the videos. I must admit, I didn't think everyone would still take part, but clearly they did, which was, 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 was fantastic. Um, and clearly we've had um, participants that have received support from the Eating Disorder Service of the Trust. We've had students, we've had staff, and we've utilised our, our links within the community to uh, produce the work today. Now clearly, um, one, uh, an, an important issue to think about here and, and, and to make sure we, we, we have addressed is getting ethical uh, approval. And we went clearly for a very stringent, rigorous process here at the university. And my thanks to colleagues there, and my thanks to colleagues from our legal services department who made sure we had the appropriate documentation in place. Filming took part during Eating Disorder Week on a late Tuesday afternoon. And uh, again, thank you uh, to colleagues that took part. And clearly, we wanted to make sure that all participants had the opportunity to review the work. So there was the opportunity to see the videos um, before they went public um, through a, 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 a password protected site. So clearly there was an opportunity for everyone to comment. And there were a few tweaks uh, from us uh, and also from the participants. Um, but also most importantly, we wanted to give the participants an opportunity to uh, shape the videos even more by giving input to the titles. And uh, my thanks to colleagues that came back with suggesting uh, changes to the titles because um, we really wanted to make them well, live, relevant, pertinent. Um, in addition, we have pulled together a survey, so clearly that will be available for uh, individuals to complete. And we would ask if you feel you can, um, there's a survey for you to complete after watching both videos. And we're wanting to see whether or not this is a tool that could be used, well, I suppose the tool that you, you know, the, the tool to, to uh, well, change, raise um, awareness, change attitudes um, towards eating disorders. Two, two before yeah. we go to the video. Just a few, just yeah. a few words. Um, so also thank you to our sponsors for allowing it to happen. And again, thank you to all the participants. Also wanted to thank Dorset Creative, who have been fantastic with the editing. Um, as Jane said, it was a Tuesday afternoon. We spent three and a half hours collecting all the footage, and we've spent a lot of time over the last few months um, looking over that footage and narrowing it down to two short videos. It was very difficult. There was such amazing stuff in there. Well, I'm so proud of the work that we've, that's come out of that. Um, one of the things that's really different about these videos, or a couple of things that are different, is unlike the YouTube videos that are out there, um, it lets the messages speak for themselves. There's no sensationalist um, images. There's nothing out there that's triggering. It is just the messages. It also shows views from lots of different um, opinions as well. So you've got views from carers. There's views from people with eating disorders. There's male views, female views. There's fe um, views from um, younger people, adults. And we've managed to cover that in just two very short four-minute videos. Um, I just wanted to kind of just say that bit really. So now is the time to show the videos. I feel quite excited. <laughs> <laughs> right, fingers crossed technology works. <laughs> You don't think that you've got one, it's not something you want to admit to yourself. But the day that I did was the day that things could start to change. Susie'd been doing running and she'd been doing really well and we'd been enjoying the fact she was getting really good at it. 
but she reached a point where she was going out on runs, almost physically and mentally collapsing and then getting really angry and sobbing at the side of the road. And I realised that actually her mood had changed. She was getting very angry and rather irrational. I was aware that Rosie had decided to change her lifestyle, so she decided to eat more healthily and take her exercise. Um, but as the months went by, it became apparent that it was getting out of control and Rosie was becoming more rigid in her behaviour and in her thought patterns. Self-harm and eating disorders weren't recognised when I was um, 11 and I was very young. I think people didn't expect you to have problems at that age. When I first heard the word anorexia involved with me, I just, just, it didn't even occur to me. I thought it was a young girl illness the, where all you had to do was eat food and you'd be fine. The signs are so hard to see early on, I, I think. She became quite manipulative, um, very secretive and quite defensive when I tried to challenge it. It can be very deceiving and you're trying to deceive other people so you're deceiving yourself. A part of me thought it was normal and then it just takes a little step back and it was that mirror moment that was like the click, that was the drop. When mum, and I remember it really distinctly, just looked me in the eyes and said that she couldn't determine whether I lived or died at that point, I could see that it was completely my responsibility. When I wasn't in school and I couldn't do anything, I couldn't meet up with anyone, I realised I had to make a change, otherwise it was going to be my life for I don't know how long. I kind of possessed some kind of belief in myself that I could actually get over it because of a lot of my story with anorexia. It was just trying to cope with it without ever really believing in myself that I could could, that life could be any different. The sooner you can talk to someone, the better. I think that it's not something you can do on your own, but there are people out there who really care and will get alongside you. They can't do it for you, but they will walk alongside you each step of the way. Believe in yourself, you can do something, because no one, no one can help you if you don't want them to help you. We learned things that we didn't know, so I didn't know that the reason Susie was so irrational was because her brain had shrunk. And I think some, when we got into the eating disorder service and we had some of the symptoms explained a bit better, it actually helped Susie and it helped me to understand some of her behaviour she couldn't actually help. It is difficult. It does get worse before it gets better, but if you arm yourself with as much support and information as you can, um, then you're helping yourself and then you're helping your child at the same time. It's only you that can it can do it. <laughs> so you just have to be strong and you just have to keep going and you have bad days and you just need to keep keep strong, keep going. Just taking each minute, hour, day as it comes and keep going, even if it feels worse before it gets better. It's really worth it. It's really worth it to recover and life can be really fun um, when you kind of start to accept yourself. don't become ill overnight and you're not going to recover overnight so it's about taking time for yourself and seeking support and being ready for that support. I think it's a really slow and delicate process but um, if you create the right environment I think people might open up. Your eating disorder isn't who you are, it's how you've coped with life and it's just a symptom of what's going on underneath. There's nothing that eating disorders thrive on more than secrecy and being kept close to you. When I started to actually be honest about it and open up people was when you know that really did help my recovery. It was more relief for everybody else. The people around me I think they already knew um, so I think they were more pleased that I accepted the fact that that was that was something that was part of me and that was I wasn't just hurting myself anymore, I wanted to get better. The main thing is to get help, whether that's from a GP initially, 
and then hopefully from some kind of eating disorder service, but also just from friends and someone that you can trust, because sometimes you just need some, a sounding board really to bounce all the stuff that's going on in your head around. You know, if you've got people around you that believe in you and understand, understanding's the hardest part, because you never want to admit or that there's something wrong with you or that there's something wrong with someone that you love. Um, but as soon as you try and understand, it all becomes clearer and then it's little steps together rather than going two different pathways to try and fix the same issue. I did have a lot of people around me that were rooting for me um, and I think for anybody that's, that's a big boost um, just to know that you've got people behind you um, who believe that you can, you can be better. Without my friends, I, I wouldn't be here. I, I was that close to not being here, so without them, there's not a chance I'd be here. Opening up about your own struggles can help people come out of denial. We all struggle with various issues. Um, it's not that I've got an eating disorder and you're perfect. It's, you know, you struggle with this, I struggle with this. When I first met Say, I was always worried I was gonna say the wrong thing or I wasn't quite sure what to say. But the best advice anyone ever gave me was just to um, just to be normal and just to like normalise your interactions. Um, so you know, if Sarah had a particularly difficult day, it would just be letting her know that I was available for a chat if she wanted to, or, or make her a cup of tea if she wanted one. Just normal interactions like that. Then it's also recognising as well that you know sometimes she might want to talk and just allowing her to have some space. Treat someone with an illness as you would with anyone who's got a broken leg or a has got cancer or anything else, it is, it's an illness. Remember who your friend is away from the illness and you know, how good a friend they can be without it. The research says that the earlier that, the earlier that it's recognised and treated, the actual the better chance of recovery is. Try and talk about it as soon as possible. The little thing that's taking over inside your head, it's not, it's not forever, it can, it can go away. I wasn't going to allow myself to be robbed anymore because um, I understood my eating disorder to be a symptom of something deeper. A big fear is actually, oh, you know, if I become a normal weight, I'm not going to get any support. But actually, there is support there, and it's not eating disorders aren't about weight. It's, you know, it's so much more than that. Finding a more positive, more constructive way of coping with things is probably the key. Keep a diary, keep writing how you're feeling because when you get to the stage that I am at now you look back and you admire yourself so much. It shows that you have a little faith within yourself and it shows that if you believe in yourself you can do something. It isn't too late, it's never too late for anyone. I think um, as we're coming to a close now, I'd like to take this opportunity to basically again say a big thank you to the participants in the latest set of videos that you've seen today, namely the participants that took part in the Time to Change Dorset films. Um, speakers that have supported our Eating Disorder a Week events, our mental health events, colleagues from the Trust, Health Watch, coming together I think has made this happened today and clearly previous events happen. Um, some of you that may have come in earlier right at the start would have noticed uh, a, a, a set of photo photos. Well, clearly I've been trying to pull together an overview of what we've been doing here um, for the last five years. Um, as I was presenting at a conference on Friday and I thought actually we need to remind ourselves and thank you Sarah for coming with me, remind us of what we've actually achieved together and um, clearly you, you would have seen some shots there and I just want to take, say thank you to Mark Story uh, for uh, agreeing to provide some of the, the music tracks free of charge to support that work uh, and clearly uh, our staff, uh, our students, 
uh, members of the wider community that have supported today. Thank you, everyone, um, for, for, for coming and for those that have come in the past. Feel free to share your, your feedback in relation to uh, seeing the videos. Um, evaluation forms are important to me in particular, uh, please. And uh, thank you again for coming. Have a good evening. Thank you.